Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. I'm not sure I need this. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Barry Kasich. Did I say it right? It sounds about right. I looked it up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Barris is finishing his PhD with uh, George Candia at EPFL, <laughs> and uh, he's done a bunch of different things, but all roughly along the lines of finding concurrency bugs. So he's going to tell us all about his most recent work on that. All right. I'll leave you. Well, thanks a lot, Dushant. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me here. It's, it's really great to be here. It's my third time here. So. All right, so this talk is going to be about getting rid of concurrency bugs, and I guess it's no surprise to this crowd that bugs are a big part of software development, but to give you an idea of how big a part they are, I'll provide you some numbers. Now, just this past year, about 35% of all the IT expenditure went into quality assurance. So that's activities like testing, debugging, and fixing of software. And this number is expected to rise to all the way up to 50% by 2018, according to some projections. Now, because quality assurance is so costly, developers basically use their resources uh, <coughs> for dealing uh, with bugs, and they cannot use these resources and their time to actually develop cool new features, which is a, a major problem. Now, one particularly challenging and notorious class of bugs is concurrency bugs. And uh, I mean, we all know that a concurrent program is one in which multiple threads of execution communicate and share resources such as memory. And it's great if you can write correct concurrent software, right? Your, your code will run faster on parallel hardware than if it were uh, just sequential. But it, it's tricky to, to write correct concurrent software. And developers make mistakes such as data races, atomicity violations, and deadlocks when writing such code. And these are concurrency bugs, essentially. And these bugs have caused losses to human lives, material losses, security vulnerabilities. And not just that, but they're also known to be time consuming when compared to other types of bugs in that they take, um, it's harder to reproduce them and it may take days or even up to weeks to properly uh, craft a fix for such bugs. Now all these extra challenges uh, make uh, tackling concurrency bugs a scientifically interesting problem. And to better grasp the ordeal that concurrency bugs have become, especially over the past 10 years, I'd like to give you a quick historical recap. Now, this black curve, of course, is the transistor count trends over the years, uh, otherwise known as Moore's law, predicting that we'll be able to double the number of transistors that we can pack into a processor approximately every 18 months, right? So this trend went on well all the way until the, the early 2000s, and all the while we had only a single core in processors. And after the early 2000s, due to various physical constraints, processor designers had to increase core counts to keep reaping the benefits of Moore's law. And they managed to do so. So it worked great. Some people called it the multi-core revolution. Right? These architectures are mainstream today. So my phone has two cores. I'm sure some of you have better phones that have four cores or eight cores. This was great. But the, the problem is that this shift happened rather quickly. and so. There were only a few people, basically, writing code for such highly parallel architectures, such as supercomputing experts, or people writing code for uh, multiprocessor systems. But all of a sudden, there were a lot of developers writing code for such parallel architectures. And they weren't necessarily well prepared to write correct concurrent software that could take advantage of the parallel hardware. And they basically unwittingly introduced concurrency bugs in their programs. Now, I'd like to come back to this previous graph, namely the, and, and focus on one particular trend, that is the core count uh, trends over the year. Now, remember that there was a sharp increase after the early 2000s. So what I did is I went ahead and asked Google Scholar how the number of papers that mentioned concurrency bugs in their titles varied over the years, and superposed this information onto the core counts graph. And as you can see, there's a, there's a, there's a clear trend in, in, in which the, after the shift to multi-core architectures, there's a proliferation of techniques that at least mention concurrency bugs in their, in their titles, right? So this is actually a fortunate situation, I'd say, because it means that academia actually took rapid interest in the growing real-world problem of concurrency bugs, as evidenced by the publication count. Yes? 
the uh, the number of papers produced <coughs> year after year is also sort of an exponential rise. Did you take into account that by producing the superposition? No, no, we didn't. I mean, it was just per year, but absolutely, yeah, that would be that would probably be the case as well. Yeah, we didn't take into account. This graph just shows per year how many. This is, might be highly misleading. It's highly misleading. It could be because if you double the number of papers that we produce per year, so then actually, sort of, the rise is not necessarily the concurrency bugs, but just because. Let's us uh, produce more papers. Okay, no, it's, it's, I mean, basically, so for every year you have more, more, more papers that are produced, right? So it means that every year there's actually more interest in some sense. So that's the trend. Yeah. All right, so to give you uh, some examples of, for instance, how concurrency bugs can compromise uh, system security, I listed a couple of uh, attacks that, that actually use uh, concurrency bugs in order to, to craft their exploits. And these are in, in popular software such as the Linux kernel and the Apache web server. Now these attacks can uh, lead an attacker to gain uh, control of the system, exfiltrate arbitrary data, or uh, you know, gain, gain control of the system. And of course there are other types of bugs that cause security vulnerabilities, but it turns out that existing defenses against security exploits can fail if attackers can actually, uh, if attackers will actually use, if attackers actually use concurrency bugs in order to craft their exploits. Which is another reason why I think it is, it, it is scientifically compelling to tackle these type of bugs. All right, so having identified the increasingly uh, more relevant problem of concurrency bugs, in my dissertation, I developed techniques to identify and fix uh, these bugs. And the approach I took is one in which I study <coughs> real systems and uh, the issues that developers face when building concurrent software. I then design techniques to solve these issues. And the key theme that recurs in these techniques that I designed is a hybrid static dynamic program analysis approach. Now, it is possible, that the, I'm, I'll tell you briefly why this hybrid approach is powerful. And uh, it's that it's possible to build dynamic analyses that are generally accurate. They, 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 give the, that, they that give the correct answers. But because dynamic analyses typically operate when the program runs, they tend to incur a lot of runtime overhead. Whereas static analyses, they run offline, so in that sense, they don't have a runtime performance overhead. But because they lack access, they lack access to execution context information of an executing program, they may actually be inaccurate. And it turns out that a carefully crafted mix of a static and dynamic approach uh, can be both accurate and efficient. And I'll give you a detailed example of this during the talk. Now, having designed these techniques, I then build real systems that actually solve these issues uh, for real-world software. Uh, and when building these systems, I strive for three key guiding principles. The first guiding principle is that of striving for low overhead, low performance overhead. Because as we'll see in a moment, the techniques I build are geared towards in production use, right? So to be used in the, in the devices that we use every day or in a data center. And so performance is, is a key design constraint. The second design goal is, achieving, is aiming for high accuracy, right? We don't wanna build inaccurate techniques and provide, um, okay, occasionally provide wrong results to, to, to developers because they will go on a wild goose chase and then they will lose time and ultimately not end up using the techniques and the tools. And, the, and finally, I try to, 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 to make sure the techniques I develop are, are usable on commodity hardware so that developers can actually quickly pick them up and start using them right away. Now, as I'll talk about the various techniques uh, that, I, that I developed in my dissertation, I'll connect back to these guiding principles and show, them, show you how they instantiate in the, in the techniques I developed uh, in my thesis. All right, so using the aforementioned approach in my dissertation, I developed techniques for the detection, root cause diagnosis, and classification of con primarily concurrency bugs. And below uh, each component of my work, you can see the venues where the related papers were published. And in practice, these three steps are essential to finding and fixing bugs, right? So obviously, developers need to detect bugs in order to be able to, to fix them. But really, more often than not, they need to understand the precise conditions that led to a failure that is associated with a bug. That's what we do during debugging. And that's what root cause diagnosis is about. And sometimes there's just a lot of bugs. So developers cannot deal with all bugs and they need to 
classify bugs according to their severity to address the really pressing ones first. Now these techniques can be used in-house uh, during testing, but I primarily strive for them to be usable in production. Uh, and the, re uh, the reason for that is this way actually we can detect bugs that impact real users. So it's a benefit for the users, but not only that, we can actually help developers because now it may, it may actually be the case that developers are not able to reproduce the failures that recur in production in their own testing setup. So it will be a win-win situation. Now, <clears throat> targeting in production bugs increases the complexity of the problem because we need to design efficient techniques to not hurt user experience. And that's why I also design infrastructure for efficient runtime monitoring that enables some of these techniques to be usable in production. All right, well at this point I'd like to emphasize another angle uh, uh, of my work, namely the practicality and the importance that I give to technology transfer. Now in particular, I integrated the, the root cause diagnosis technique uh, that I'll talk about in detail in this talk to GDB when I worked at Intel over this past summer, and this tool is uh, still being used and maintained within Intel, and we're actually working actively with Intel to release the whole integration as open source uh, to the public as of now. Uh, also, while I was working at uh, Microsoft Research uh, in 2013, I, I used the efficient, this efficient runtime monitoring infrastructure that I designed to build a cold co code coverage tool for uh, Windows. And this code coverage tool was uh, very efficient in that well, with, with our tests with all Windows 8 system binaries, so that's uh, almost 700 binaries, it incurred uh, really small overheads of 1 to 6%. And, uh, and thanks to these advantages, uh, I mean, after I left, this, this product was, uh, this, this, this line of work was also continued within Microsoft. And, you know, last time I heard it was still being worked on. But, you know, I haven't kept up uh, with the re more recent developments in the, in the last six months or so. All right. So, in the context of today's talk, coming back to basically this, 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 this map of my dissertation research, I will focus on uh, the technique I designed for root cause diagnosis of failures in production. And although this technique is general in that uh, it can perform root cause diagnosis for non-concurrency bugs, in the context of today's talk, I will mainly focus on concurrency bugs. Now this technique is called GIST because it conveys the gist of the failure to developers, which is the root cause itself. And when describing GIST, I will first give a background and overview for GIST, and then I will explain the, the, the details of the design of GIST, and then I'll finally <laughs> present some evaluation results that we obtained when applying GIST to real-world uh, software. All right, so before I delve into describing GIST, let me clarify that root cause diagnosis is, is a hard scientific problem for several key reasons. Now the first uh, uh, challenge is that, uh, is, is that of an efficiency challenge, right? So performing root cause diagnosis requires gathering significant execution information uh, from programs that, that execute uh, out there in the wild, and it, this may actually be really expensive. So this may incur a significant runtime performance overhead. What do you, what do you think the root causes of what? Right, so you're saying a program has crashed or something has, there must be something you're seeking. Sure, sure, sure. So, the fail, I will. Or, you know, there might be bugs that don't sure, show in any. Absolutely. Way. I will. Long amount of money ends up in the bank account. So. Sure, sure, absolutely. I'll actually get to that, and it's a really good question. So, in our work, we make the assumption that there's actually an observable means to detect a failure. And so, when I talk about future work, I'll suggest what ways to deal with the limitations that arise from this assumption. But for, for the context of this work, we're going to target things like, yes, crashes or you know, an assertion firing or a hang or something, something that we can observe that we can actually associate to a failure, essentially. Okay, so something bad has happened, which might have been caused by something way in the past. It may be way in the past. That's your root cause. That's your root cause, yeah. Well, we'll see that a statistical definition works better. There, it's really hard to make an absolute a claim for what the root cause is. So people have been working on this for a really long time, you know, defining what the cause of something is. But uh, it, it, as I'll show, a, a more statistical, basically, um, events that are primarily correlated with the occurrences of failures, it turns out that they are actually 
in practice, root causes of failures that developers end up removing from code. I'll get to that. All right, so the second challenge is that of an ac accuracy challenge. So, of course, developers don't want false positives or false negatives in, in, in root cause diagnosis, right? So in the case of root cause diagnosis, a false positive would mean pointing developers to a wrong root cause, and false negatives would mean entirely missing the root causes of certain, certain failures. Now, finally, targeting in production uh, uh, bugs actually aggravates the efficiency challenge, right, because of the stringent requirements on efficiency for in production code. And not just that, but it may actually not be possible, right, as I told before, to reproduce the failures that, that occur in production in a testing setup. So this is an added challenge that comes with targeting in production bugs. Now, there's a significant body of related work that dealt with the various aspects uh, of root cause diagnosis of software failures that range all the way from collaborative approaches to approaches that use test cases to reproduce the failures to isolate their root causes, uh, approaches that rely on record replay techniques or runtime checkpointing techniques or that rely on hardware support to perform root cause diagnosis. And we do really build upon all this prior work, although it is worth mentioning the assumptions that prior work make for root cause diagnosis. And in particular, some prior work makes the assumption that there is some sort of special hardware support or special runtime state checkpointing support that can help with uh, root cause diagnosis, which may not necessarily be the case in practice. But perhaps more importantly, a lot of the prior work makes the assumption that there's actually a means to reproduce the failures that occur in, in production in a testing setup in order to perform root cause diagnosis, which may also not generally be the case. Pretty much all prior work uh, makes the assumption that um, the failures can actually be uh, detected. So there's an observable means to detect failures. <laughs> and in our work, we actually revise these assumptions to target our use case of uh, uh, finding the root causes of in-production failures. And in particular, <clears throat> this makes the assumption that there is an observable means for it to detect failures. And as I mentioned, I'll get back to this assumption uh, and talk a little bit about it in future work and how we can deal with the limitations that arise from it. All right, so the key component of the design of GIST is a hybrid static dynamic program analysis approach. And essentially, a heavyweight in-house static analysis is an enabler for a subsequent lightweight dynamic analysis. And it's really the synergy that allows GIST to perform eff efficient and accurate root cause diagnosis in production. All right, to give an overview of GIST, I'll first talk about the software usage model today. Uh, so, you know, developers develop some programs and users run these programs. And uh, so uh, at, uh, at, uh, in, in, in their mobile phones or, or in the cloud in a data center or, or on, the, on their personal computer, at the end of the day, these are endpoints where users run their programs. Now, I'm sure some of you are familiar uh, with this occasional error message that pops up in Windows systems. Uh, this is an old one, actually. Uh, uh, the, uh, other systems have similar messages as well. So Mac OS X, I mean, have similar infrastructure as well. Mac OS X and Linux variant also have uh, similar error reporting infrastructures. And if you click on send error report uh, after a failure, the systems on which this failure uh, occurs will, will ship back some information back to developers. And developers can actually identify this information to debug their code, to, to fix the bug, and, uh, and then improve the quality of their programs. And as mentioned previously, this, 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 this detective effort, this finding the, the, the actual root cause of the bug is actually a, a, a hard thing. So it may not necessarily be possible, right, for, for failures that are not easy to reproduce and so on. Now, again, in the context of this talk, you know, when I'm talking about root causes, what I mean is, is the statistical definition of a root cause. So events that are primarily correlated with the occurrences of failures are root causes for our purposes. And I'll show that this practical definition is actually useful uh, for, for real world bugs. Yes? So you said this is the definition. So you're going to expand on this definition uh, later on, or is that it? So I'm not going to expand on the definition, but I, I'm going to show that this, approaching uh, the definition of a root cause in a statistical way is useful. That's what I'm going to show. What primarily actually means. Yeah, so I'm not going to get into details. We can talk about, I don't have time to do that, but basically we use methods from uh, information retrieval uh, 
to associate certain patterns with the occurrences of failures. So it's that that's actually a little deeper than that. We can talk about it offline if you, yeah, sounds good. All right, so, but that, that's a really good point. So the primarily actually, uh, is, 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 that's what it's trying to say. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, this, this, this whole detective effort is, is a hard thing and just actually targets, precisely targets this problem. So it is a technique uh, that automates this difficult debugging effort by creating what we call failure sketches. And informally, failure sketches are representations that convey the root causes of failures to developers. And I'll uh, describe a little more in detail what uh, failure sketches are in a, in a moment, but you can think of them as representations that the developer can look at and then see uh, the root cause of the failure. Yeah. And then I'm just gonna give an example in the next slide, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, I mean, uh, without further ado, uh, perhaps let me show you what a failure sketch looks like. And, uh, and aside from formatting, this is the output of GIST, so this is for a real bug. So in this representation, basically time flows downward and the executions in an execute, uh, I'm sorry, the, the steps in an execution are enumerated along that flow of time. The failure sketch shows uh, two, uh, the statements from two threads that are related to the failure and their order of occurrence with respect to the enumerated steps. Now, I'd like to look at, I'd like you to look at this representation and perhaps tell me what the bug in this program is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it, it takes you one second to, to to spot the bug, but I mean, if you're even if you're not a a really good developer, then then actually the failure sketch actually provides you more more information. So in particular, this these red boxes and the arrow between them say that primarily in failing executions, the the free statement from from thread one occurs before executes before the mutex unlock statement in thread two. Now, maybe yeah, many other things. Yeah, sure. There will be thousands of things, yeah, but we, be, be, I'll get to that, but we know the patterns to look for, basically. So this pattern of actually, you know, a, a write basically followed by a read, let's say, or a free followed by a, its dereference, and we know to associate that pattern with the occurrence of a failure. So we will know, I will get to that in detail, I will get to the details of it, but we will know what patterns to seek for in, in actually the executions that we monitor. And that actually is really helpful in determining what are the key ones that we should highlight on the, on the failure sketch. But maybe you can actually tell me how to fix this bug now. Like one way to fix it. What, what, what would be? Don't unlock. Don't? Don't unlock. Don't unlock. <laughs> yeah. I mean, presumably without altering the semantics of the program that much, I guess. What's that? Free it on thread two. Free it on thread two, yeah. So basically order some ordering in some sense, right? Do, uh, do the freeing in thread two. That, and I mean, I guess it is, it, it, is, it is clear, but you know, it turns out that actually in this case, and also in other cases according to our experience and evaluation, these differences that are shown on the, the failure sketch point to the root causes of failures. And as you mentioned, so one way to fix this would be to free this in thread two. And another way, which the developers did, is that they actually basically waited for thread two to join thread one before freeing the, 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 the mutex. And although it actually took them four months to fix this bug, so from the time the bug was filed and the time it was fixed, it took them four months. Now, I'm not saying that they actually debugged this thing for four months. To, to, to remove it from their code. What I'm saying is that if they had such a representation, it would have taken them a much shorter time to actually remove this uh, bug from their code. All right, so I'll begin uh, by... So, so wait, you said that, so this is a failure sketch. Exactly what you showed. So yes. somehow you're able to ignore the thousands of things that might have that occurred before that free. Yes. And you identified the free as being the... Yes. Well, it's just another procedure call, isn't it? It's always free magic somehow. No, free is not magic. So you could think of it, you could think of it as a write as well. So let's say you write null uh, to a value and then you could do reference. We could have found that out too. I'll get to that in the detail, but the, basically the, the, the key idea is that 
from the failure point, we, we monitor only a small number of events and we use a combination of static and dynamic analysis to know actually what to monitor. And then basically it will narrow down the space that we monitor based on this general observation that in most cases root causes are close to the failures, which may not necessarily be the case. So I'm going to talk about that too. But it turns out that in practice, that's, that's, a, that's a useful way to at least start tackling uh, concurrency bugs. Analysis. Yes, I'm okay. going to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So, but I'll first begin by describing the high-level architecture of just by explaining how the solution that we propose actually fits into the usage model that I described. And uh, basically just as a client-server architecture. So the server side performs a heavyweight static analysis and the client side performs lightweight dynamic analysis. Now, the server side takes as input the program source code and the, the failure report. And so the failure report could be the core dump, the, the stack trace, or the instruction pointer of the failing uh, instruction. And then it feeds these inputs into a static analyzer that computes a static slice based off of uh, these inputs. Now, I'll give a more precise definition of what a static slice is in a moment, but you can think of the, the static slice as containing statements that are related to the failure. Now. The, 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 then basically what just does is it, uh, it instructs the runtimes in, uh, in, in, its, in its client side to gather more control flow and data value information uh, from both failing and successful executions by essentially uh, taking into account the static slice that the static analyzer computed. Now, it just essentially, uh, gathers this control flow and data flow information and uses, these, uses this information to refine the static slices. Now, in particular, refinement removes from the static slice statements that don't get executed during actual executions, and it adds to the slice information such as access orderings. Now, this is essential to do uh, because static analysis actually lacks uh, access to this type of dynamic information that is basically only available at program execution time. Now, another server component of GIST then uses these refined uh, slices from failing and successful executions to determine salient differences between them and to finally build the failure sketch. All right, so this was the high-level overview of GIST. So I'll uh, start by uh, describing the details of design of GIST, and then for that, I'll actually first uh, uh, talk about how static analysis is being performed within GIST. Now, static analysis. So one particular bug. So you got one particular crisis yes. as a crash. This yes. So that would bootstrap the process. Analysis, you add the instrumentation. You redeploy yep. this modified. You can. We can dynamically instrument the program. I mean, we don't have to redeploy the entire program. Okay, but some, somehow the yes. endpoints are now executing a modified. Program. That is correct. That, place, that is so correct. Right. Yes. So there's, uh, and it will aim at that one bug. Yes. Right. And if that doesn't show up again, then then yes. Okay. Yes. Some other bug might show up, but. We, we, the thing is, we can do the instrumentation for multiple bugs at the same time, and I will show that uh, because we uh, because the overhead of actually gathering these runtime traces is fairly low, we can actually target multiple bugs at the same time to increase the probability that we will fit. Yeah. So, yeah, again, so the static analysis of just basically builds static backward slices uh, with the primary goal of reducing uh, the subsequent overhead of runtime tracing. Now, a static backward slice will start from a certain statement of interest. In this case, it will be the failing statement. And uh, include statements that the failing statement depends on. And when I'm talking about dependencies, I'm talking about both read and write dependencies in this case. Now, because just exclude statements that the failing statement doesn't depend on, it will allow subsequent uh, runtime tracking to be more efficient. Now, finally, static analysis in GIST is interprocedural because failure sketches can actually span function boundaries. So GIST has to account for this, uh, for this fact and look at uh, multiple functions and the function calls among them. All right, to better understand, yes. So, uh, so you have uh, uh, some point analysis analysis that sort of uh, yes, is interprocedural yes. I, and works well for multi-threaded? Yes, it, I mean, it, it works well in the sense it is not accurate at all. It needs to, to be 
certainly refine the, it really depends on where the failure is. So if at the failure point you have a certain type that allows you to prune a large portion of the statement, large number of statements from your slice, then it works well. But if you're on a void pointer, for instance, it's not gonna work well. And it's gonna have, the, the slice is gonna have a lot of statements and you would require more runtime tracing to actually refine it. It really depends on where the failing statement is. Yes, and, uh, existing, uh, yes, analysis. yes. Yeah, Data structure analysis from LLVM, so. Chris Lattner's thesis, basically. Yeah. All right, so to better understand how slicing works, I'll walk you through an example, and I'll continue using this example to explain the rest of the operation of gist. In this example, there is a, a cleanup function that prints some debug messages and deletes the memory allocated to the state object S, and there's a display size function that actually, again, prints some debug messages and then displaces the size of the state object S. There's, of course, other code in this program, and in particular code that calls these functions, but they're uh, irrelevant for the purposes of understanding this example. Now, it turns out that certain users observe this program to crash when the display size function actually prints the size field of uh, the state object S, and I'll explain to you step by step how just uh, will help us determine the root cause of this failure. All right, so in this first step, just compute the static backward slice starting from the failure point. And in our example, it will remove the function calls uh, upon entry to the functions, uh, clean up and display size. And this is because the failing operation, namely the loading of the size field of S, uh, is not influenced by these statements. Now the key takeaway from the static analysis of GIST is that it helps following dynamic analysis monitor fewer events than it would otherwise require monitoring. And in particular, it actually reduces the cost of control flow tracking by a factor of 20 when it's combined with an adaptive technique that I will, I will talk about in a minute. So somehow, why don't I delete all of cleanup? The, why don't you? There's, there's, there's so we do, we do use a global alias analysis that will tell us that actually the S in here will, could alias to S in here. So that's oh, why. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, so there was a question. I thought, oh. yeah, OK. So the, the analysis is interprocedural. That's what I meant. Basically, it will, it, it will have a global alias analysis that will allow us to resolve these interprocedural dependencies, actually. Yeah, see, sure. So you're saying that you're going to be able to tell whether a function parameter of one procedure could possibly be the same value as a function parameter of another procedure, or perhaps a local variable. Yes, of another procedure. sure. Okay. Yeah. And that's going to be pretty conservative. It is going to be conservative, yeah. Although we do have some optimism. But it might even be a completely different type, you know, yeah. char star s. Sure, 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 okay. sure, sure, yeah. How did you know log didn't perturb the state of the stack? So we do, I mean, in this particular example, we do have access to this, uh, the, the, source code the source code of log. So whenever we have access to the source code of, log, uh, of any function, we will proceed. But if we don't have access, let's say, if, and if we know, if we all, at least we want to assume that a certain function is not going to have any side effects, we will just annotate it as such and exclude it from the analysis. It's a really good point. Yeah. Is a, is a whole program analysis. Yes. So it takes all the program, including all the libraries, yes. all the way down into the operating system. As much as, as much code I mean, you have. Yeah. everything. As much code you have, basically. Or otherwise, you'll have to make assumptions, conservative assumptions, in the sense that if you don't annotate something as not having a side effect, you'll have to assume that it will have a side effect. Oh. And that it, the, whatever you pass in. You can annotate library functions in some way, then. You, you could, could annotate, annotate, yes, you can. You can say exclude this from the, you can say printf does not have side effects, so exclude it from your analysis. Okay. Yes. And do, is that important in practice, in, in your work? So in we did fields. annotate certain library functions. It is important in practice, yeah, yeah. All right, so now that I explained how GIST performs static slicing, I'll talk about how both dynamic control flow tracking and data value tracking that GIST performs using instrumentation helps with the refinement of these slices. Now, control flow tracking allows just to perform slice refinement by identifying uh, statements that get executed during actual executions and removing from the slice statements that don't get executed. Now, assume that this control flow graph actually represents the control flow in a static slice. So the edges are branches in the slice and nodes are basic blocks, so contiguous sets of statements, contiguous uh, statements uh, without, without any branch statement. And uh, so what just does is it 
it, it actually uh, tracks the control flow and refines static slices using a new hardware technology from Intel called the processor trace. So the processor, processor tracing essentially allows just to determine the actual paths that the program take during execution. So in particular, for instance, in this example, the blue path turns out to be the actual path that the program executed at runtime. So, Wait, so, so is this yes. within one procedure or is this across the entire? Across the entire. Across yeah. the, so yes. this is the, this is the this is across the entire program, procedures yeah, all. Yes, so this is like... Effectively unrolling procedures in, in this... Yes, program. exactly. So it will have a... It's a dynamic trace of the branches that are taken in the program. Yes. So th that's what Intel, Intel processor tracing will give you, basically. I see. Yeah, yeah. So for millions of instructions, it will give you a dynamic trace... It depends on how you configure it. So you can... What's that? Every branch instruction in a program. Yes, it's a little more smart, uh, smarter than that. There's a compressed way of actually uh, logging the branches. So okay. it will do smart tricks because it will actually offload most of the tasks to decoding time. So it will not actually record everything, but reconstruct the execution. Yeah, but in, in practice, you can actually get that, that information that you're talking about. Wow. Yes. From an actual execution? From an actual from, execution. From many hours of execution? Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, it depends on how much you log, of course. Okay. Yeah, it depends on your use case. So it turns out that, for instance, uh, if you do full program uh, tracking, for a, we, we tested this for a broad range of desktop and server applications, we observed overheads of uh, around 40, runtime performance overheads of 40%, which is quite better than if you were to have a software-only solution. But it's still not acceptable if you want to deploy this in practice, right? And basically, uh, basically what, what, uh, what GIST does is using a combination of static analysis and an adaptive technique that I'll just talk about in a minute, it will reduce this 40% overhead to, 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 to like 2%, 3% overhead. It will make it more acceptable to be deployed in production. So coming back to the example uh, that I previously talked about, uh, what happens is that when, when just tracks the control flow, it will determine that the log line that's printing the, the, the address of the, the pointer S is never uh, actually executed. And this is expected because in most cases, when people deploy code in production, they will disable verbose debugging messages. And so just is able to remove that line has never been executed in the executions that it monitored. All right. So maybe at this point, it's important to emphasize the synergy between static analysis and this dynamic control flow tracking. So these two techniques collectively help narrow down the set of statements that a developer needs to actually look at to, uh, to reason about the root cause of a failure. Uh, in particular, static analysis removes statements that are not related to a failure, and control flow tracking removes from the slice statements that don't get executed during actual executions. All right, so for tracking data values, just uses another hardware feature, feature namely watch points. So, Watch points can observe a certain address uh, in a program and cause the CPU to trap if there's a, a read or a write access to that, uh, to that uh, address. It could be configured, it could be just read, just write, and so on. Uh, and it can actually do all of this with a low overhead. And another really important thing that we can do with watch points is that we can actually track the total order of execution uh, of, of statements accessing the memory and augment failure sketches with this information. Now this information is critical. It's, it's critical to obtain this ordering information uh, in order to, re to reason about failures for which the, the root cause is a concurrency bug. Yes? Does this alter the weak memory behavior of a processor? What's that? Does this alter the behavior of a processor in terms of the weak memory behaviors you see? So it will cause the yes. buffer to be flushed? Yeah. It, 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 can, it can actually serialize the execution in a way that you will not observe certain behaviors that you would have otherwise observed. It can happen, yes. Which, to be clear, means that the instrumentation might conceal the bug. The instrumentation may mask a bug. Okay. It may also expose a bug. <laughs> yeah. Because it's effectively altering the schedule. The thing is, of course, there's not, there's not a formal guarantee or anything, but it is minimally, I mean, I, I don't want to claim minimalness, but it is less intrusive than a software-only solution, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, coming back to our example, just we'll essentially go ahead and place a watch point at the, the, the address of the state object S, and it will monitor the values uh, of S and, as well as the order of accesses to, to S. And it will determine that essentially in successful executions, 
That's the ones that don't end up, uh, you know, observing this failure. Uh, the, the, the statement that prints the size of the state object S actually executes before the, the delete statement, and these two statements execute in different threads. Now, I'd like, you to, I'd like to note that there's a notion of threads at this point, right? With static analysis, we, we, it was like a flat program structure, so now we have actually a view of threads after doing this dynamic analysis. And if the cleanup code, of course, executes before, uh, the, the logging of the size field of S will encounter the failure. So, okay, so explain to me why it was a failure. Why doesn't it just print a dump value? Sure, yeah, that's a good point. So, I mean, for the sake of this example, we can assume that we compile the code in a way that, that it will actually, whenever we free the memory, the next time we reference it, it will actually cause, a, a, let's say, it will throw an exception. So, I believe even Microsoft compilers actually can allow you to do that, so you can actually pad the values when you free, uh, when you free them, so the next time you reference them, you would actually know, you would actually detect the use after free bug. But even if that's not the case, what can happen is that if somebody else allocates that memory, which can happen if there's a lot of churn in the program, right, you will actually access some other memory and you could incur a segmentation fault. It may not happen always, but it can happen. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> This came back from your first dump. It was a crash. Yeah. You said the crash happened as you dereferenced, you know, there was a bad value in this yeah. memory location. Let's watch that memory location. But the next time you run it, it might allocate in a different place. Or are you relying on ev executions being sort of repeatable? With no, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't watch an address. We would do it this dynamically, basically. So, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So yeah. how do you know what to watch? Maybe I should ask that question. So, so we, I mean, whenever we were refining the slice, we would actually watch memory accesses in the slice, basically. So we put a watch point whenever, where, wherever there's going to be a memory access, essentially, so to, to the address of the memory access. So the instrumentation will make sure to resolve the proper address at runtime to put the watch point and watch it accordingly. Does that make sense? But in the previous example, there could be a lot of... Uh, Absolutely, so, yeah. Of, sure. Which one do you want? There could, there could be a lot of them, and so aside from anything, aside from things on the stack, we have to watch all of them, and there's only limited resources, uh, the limited number of watch points that we can place, which is four on x86, for instance. What we'll do is we'll place, we'll watch whatever we can for a given execution, and then we'll, we will actually distribute the watching task to multiple users to actually cover the whole, uh, basically, portion of the slice that we're refining, and do essentially watch values for for all the memory accesses in the slice, but across multiple executions. So we will this basically we will use the crowd in some sense because we lack the resources to actually look at memory accesses for a given execution for uh, you know all the memory accesses. So in each execution, you pick. Uh, so yes, you would pick. Or not or randomly. So you would make sure that you would actually cover, like if you're, if you're refining a slice, right, you have 10 statements, you would look at the, f the last four from the failure point, basically, in one execution, and then you would keep going on to, so that you cover all of them. So it's not random. For 4,000 uh, variables, you would need 1,000 machines. Yes, you would need 1,000 executions. 1, yes, yeah, that's true. All right, so yeah. Uh, so what this does, though, is when it's tracking this control flow and data values, it will actually perform refinement in an adaptive manner. Uh, and the reason for that is the, the slice can grow to be quite large, and so performing refinement on the slice, uh, despite using this hardware support, can actually incur a lot of runtime performance overhead. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about how actually just adaptively refines the slice to, to, uh, to get a better picture of uh, the control flow of the program, but actually doing the same thing for data values is, is again, in a, I mean, refinement for data values is done in a similarly adaptive manner as well. Again, this is the control flow in the, in the, in the slice. So the, 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 the basic block where the failure occurs is also seen on the, is also seen on the slide. And so what this does is it starts uh, tracking a small number of statements uh, from the slice based on a common observation from prior work that in most cases, root causes of failures are close to the failures themselves. Now just then builds a failure sketch using uh, this refined slice and continues refining increasingly larger portions 
of the slice at, until it can provide developers uh, with a failure sketch that contains the root cause of the failure. Now this technique is effective because as I mentioned previously, it turns out in most cases, root causes are close to the failures. But this technique is still useful if that's not the case. So if, if root causes are actually far away from failures, far away in time and space, the, the technique will still work, in which case just we'll have to monitor even larger slices and potentially incur more runtime performance overhead. So that's the trade-off there, basically. All right, so we saw how GIST performs control flow and data value tracking to refine the, the, the slices. Uh, so let's look at how it monitors multiple user executions to determine the key differences among them uh, to isolate the root causes of failures. Now, Again, consider our running example. So a deletion of S is followed by another uh, thread's dereference of S. So in abstract terms, this is a write followed by a read in a particular order in two different threads that leads to a failure. So this type of failure is a common type of failure in multi-threaded programs. It's called an order violation. What just does is it seeks in refined slices of, uh, basically it, 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 it seeks in refined slices this order violation pattern and also other patterns of common concurrency bugs, such as atomicity violations and data races. Now remember that just seeks these patterns both in failing and successful executions. It can therefore statistically determine that, uh, that it can therefore statistically determine patterns that are primarily uh, correlated with the, fail, uh, the, with the failing executions uh, and essentially highlight them as root causes on the failure sketch. So coming back to our example, just goes ahead and monitors multiple uh, user executions, and it determines that indeed in failing executions, the same failing ordering is exhibited, whereas in successful executions, this ordering is not observed. Just then computes that statistically speaking, the pattern where the deletion of the pointer, at, uh, the, the deletion of the pointer S followed by its dereference is the best predictor of failure. Now at this point, just has all the information necessary uh, to build the, the, the failure sketch that shows the root cause of the failure, which essentially looks like this. All right, so we discussed the design of GIST. Uh, now I'd like to briefly talk about how we evaluated it. So we evaluated our GIST prototype using real world systems such as the Apache web server, SQLite embedded database, and, and Memcache distributed object. Uh, cache, and in this section I'll basically answer the questions of whether GIST is effective and whether it is efficient. Now to answer the question of whether GIST is effective, uh, we had to determine whether the failure sketches built by GIST actually allow developers to perform root cause diagnosis. And what we did for this is we manually analyzed the failure sketches for 11 failures that uh, just, for which GIST automatically built failure sketches, and we determined that the root causes identified by GIST are actually the root causes that developers ended up removing from their programs uh, by examining the patches that they actually put, into, put in place. An interesting result here is that GIST reduced the average number of statements that a developer needs to look at uh, to seven in order to basically to identify the root cause of a failure, which is orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the sizes of the programs that we looked at, which is why we believe GIST, GIST was useful. We then evaluated the efficiency of GIST by measuring the runtime performance overhead that it imposes on the executions that it monitors. Now on the y-axis, uh, you can see the runtime performance overhead of GIST across all runs. And on the x-axis, you can see the number of statements uh, in the slice that GIST monitors. And the unit here is in terms of LLVM statements in the static slice because that's the intermediate representation of the compiler framework that we rely on to do our static analysis. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, the runtime performance overhead incurred by GIST increases monotonically with the size of the slice that GIST monitors during actual executions, and this is what this graph shows. The good news is overall, GIST has low average runtime performance overhead of below 5%, and the overhead values have actually very small variance of below 0.1%, so that's also another uh, good indicator for GIST performance. Now to recap this section, I, I talked about GIST, which gathers data from failing and successful executions and uses a combination of 
static and dynamic analysis to build failure sketches that point the root causes of failures to developers. Now, there's more information on this web page about GIST, uh, such as related source code, and we're working, uh, again, as I mentioned, so there, there's this integration of GIST with GDP that we internally uh, realized at Intel, and we're working with Intel to release this integration to the public, which is coming soon. <coughs> All right, so we talked about a little bit for, about the over, overview of my uh, work and uh, in detail about root cause diagnosis. At this point, I'd like to say a few words about uh, uh, some current work that I'm doing and some future work that I'm very excited to, to be doing uh, in the near and, uh, and in the long term. Now, basically, some of the techniques that I developed, I didn't have a time to talk about detection, but, you know, for instance, root cause diagnosis, actually relies on gathering execution information from, uh, from programs running out there in the wild, right, from users and then using this information to improve the quality of software. And this, this clearly comes with privacy implications, right? So I'd like to work on techniques that actually uh, like respect the privacy of users all the while uh, improving the quality of software in a meaningful way. So currently, uh, I'm actually taking the root cause diagnosis line of work and extending it to tackle security vulnerabilities. And I believe that what we can, what we, we, we will be able to actually gather execution information from failing and successful executions, let's say, and not just that, but you know, just any execution basically, and using some machine learning, build a model of good versus bad executions. And in, in, that con in this context, what bad, for instance, could mean uh, is, is an execution that has a security vulnerability, for instance. Now, Basically, using this ML approach, we can, we can basically build this model and then essentially deviations from the model uh, can potentially be indicative of bad behavior. And essentially, this, this, this ML approach can allow us to go back and revise the assumption that we made initially uh, when we were designing GIST in that we were actually relying on failures to be detectable uh, they're, they're in, an, in an observable way. And so, Essentially, we can tackle that assumption and then allow just to become more powerful uh, by using a machine learning approach. Yes? So how would the input to this model look like? I mean, you, you observe traces or several traces in, in parallel, so you, you have like some unlim unlimited DAG or parallel sequences to, as input to the model. So how mm -hmm. would you process that on the machine learning side? So you would have to have a sufficiently powerful uh, representation. For instance, a Markov model probably wouldn't work because you couldn't um, you couldn't probably encode the basically the procedure model. But you would have to rely on certain a certain model that is powerful enough to represent an execution. Yeah. So I don't necessarily have a good idea. I'm not an expert by any stretch, but this is ripe for collaboration, basically, for me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I want to ask a question about you, the performance of your gist. So you said that you were assuming that the heap has been replaced with one that's a page heap, so that every time something is free, that you on map the virtual addresses, so that you can catch references like the S size, uh, and make your your uh, detect your failure detectable. So of the five percent overhead, how much of that overhead is due to completely replacing the heap implementation on the system? So we don't replace the heap implementation. I can talk about in detail what I meant by actually when I was when I was answering your question. So I guess I couldn't communicate that well. But let me just go through this. I'm almost done, and then I can I can talk in detail offline about that. Yeah. Again, so one other thing is, of course, concurrency is present not just in the single node level, but it's, it's, it's there in, the, in distributed uh, systems. And our reasoning and understanding capabilities regarding, uh, uh, regarding these systems can improve, uh, actually can, uh, can improve significantly, I believe, if we can uh, apply some of the lessons learned you know, in, the, in this prior work. Uh, so, the, finally, basically, the overarching goal of my work has been to help developers deal with the challenges uh, that they face due to emerging technology trends. And one uh, particular challenge that I addressed was the challenge you know, in software development due to shift from single core to multi-core architectures, right? So there are all sorts of other challenges that developers are facing today due to other emerging trends such as heterogeneous computing systems and Internet of Things. Now, 
the, these challenges uh, present themselves in the form of programmability challenges as well as security challenges. And I think we need to rethink the, the, the system stack and the, the programming APIs and abstractions to basically allow developers to take advantage uh, of these emerging trends with all the while avoiding the possible pitfalls. And I'm also really excited to, to work on this too. Before concluding, I'd like to thank uh, uh, a lot of people uh, that actually helped me with, uh, with this work. So it wouldn't have been possible to do all this work without the help of all these people. There's a lot of Microsoft people as well. And uh, so this brings me to the conclusion of my talk. So I presented to you an overview of the techniques I worked on today. I talked in detail about root cause diagnosis. And I also mentioned how the various techniques I developed uh, were, uh, were you know, used uh, uh, by some technology companies. And I showed that the techniques I developed are actually efficient uh, and effective. And as a closing thought, I'd like to mention that I believe complexity is unavoidable in software systems and it's ever growing. And uh, I believe we need techniques to better understand and tame this complexity. And the techniques that I built primarily in, during my dissertation were geared towards uh, allowing developers to better reason about uh, concurrent programs. And I believe that the results that I showed show that I've taken a positive step towards that direction. Thanks for listening and coming to my talk. I can take more questions if time permits. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, so you're relying on the static analysis for slicing. Yes. Yeah? And this one is field sensitive, but it's not control sensitive, otherwise it wouldn't scale, right? Yes. And uh, so it, it looks like sort of a, a pattern sort of that shows up in your examples is that you free x on one thread, and then you access x dot, you know, foo in the yeah. other thread. Yeah, and um, so the if the sort of the uh, probably there are not that many uh, uh, pointers that have uh, uh, full sort of uh, sort of uh, pointer dot full around your code, and then sort of the uh, the, the Alice analysis recognizes that freeing x here actually uh, sort of now is going to uh, take the x from all something dot full occurrences. And if the number of the, those occurrences is sufficiently small, yeah, so then, okay, so your, your slice is going to be uh, sort of manageable. Yes. Yeah, so do you have any sort of uh, estimate? Have you looked at actually sort of how effective is uh, point analysis in, in sort of pruning? Yeah, so, so it's, it's not, I, honestly, for large programs, it's not very effective. So it's not uncommon, for instance, for a single call site, let's say in a program like Apache, to point to hundreds of functions, whereas in actually, in runtime, it's just gonna be, it's a function point, it's just gonna point to a single function or, or two functions, for instance. So as the program size gets large, it doesn't work that well. You're saying like that that's where the dynamic information kicks in? Yes. And so, the, is it, uh, what it, so you're alluding that it's very effective in sort of in narrowing down function pointers to just one. It yeah. is not very effective, yeah. No, the dynamic stuff. The, the dynamic, dynamic stuff, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and so wh what are the other dimensions uh, of sort of narrowing down and pruning where this dynamic thing is effective? Yeah, so I think another one, so basically then there's another way of looking at it. So wh when is static analysis very effective, basically? Yes, but that will actually identify uh, places where dynamic analysis kicks in. So is the static analysis helps, for instance, when I, when, with, with things like when there's like a clear type that can actually prune a lot of the things. When that doesn't happen, dynamic analysis kicks in, basically, and essentially uh, helps you better re refine the slice in some sense. So when, whenever the types that you're operating on are, you know, let's say common types, not, nothing specific, then the, then, the, then the alias analysis doesn't work well and the slices grow to be quite large. So and the types don't help you in C, right? Because you've got cast. Yeah. So uh, what's this reference to types? So, I mean, I don't know the internals of how data structure analysis works, but I think, I believe that it relies on some type information to prune out. Uh, well, which might not be true. I mean, the type information might just be wrong. Oh. Okay, so let me get you out yeah. of the situation. Can you compare with the thread sanitizer? Thread sanitizer, which dimension? Thread sanitizer is a data risk detection tool. Versus thread sanitizer, so. Uh, so thread sanitizer is a data risk detection tool. So it just detects data risks. So. It looks like they give you a very high fidelity sort of debugging information. 
Yes, yes. So, the, so threat sanitizer is actually, uh, uh, I would say, like fully accurate in that it, is, it doesn't have any false positives. So whatever it will report to you is actually going to be you know, dynamically observed, and it will be an actual, let's say, data race. But it just works for data races, right? It doesn't work for other types of concurrency problems. So it will keep track. You can track. encode everything. Once you can handle a safety property, we can encode the other uh, violations. Oh, well, it's not that easy, I would say. For instance, no, no, so let's not get into that. What I'm yeah. curious about is, Imagine you have a data race, and so you have your slice, and sort of you trim the sort of it a lot using the dynamic information. Sort of, is it plausible to feed uh, the result of uh, sort of slicing and pruning into uh, TSAM? Yes, yeah. definitely. So you can combine anyway static analysis with uh, dynamic analysis to improve uh, the both the performance behavior and also, I mean. I wouldn't say accuracy of data restriction, but accuracy of root cause diagnosis. And that's something we did actually in prior work. So our detection, I, couldn't, I didn't have time to talk about it, but we essentially combined something like TSAN, like a dynamic detector, together with static data risk detection, to basically allow it to, to have much lower overhead than it would have otherwise had uh, in production. Because some, something like TSAN has maybe like 20x overhead on uh, you know, any, rate, any, any, any reasonable size program. Yeah. And stop the official talk now, and people can continue with Barry's uh, either now or later if you have a yeah. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.